Hello everyone. I hope everyone is well, sitting wherever you are in your homes all over Northeast India. Today I'm going to talk about gender. Gender is a word that we use in linguistics to talk about classes of nouns. Okay, so grammatical gender, which is probably what we have to call it today, is a grammatical distinction that allows words to be divided into categories. Such categories can include masculine, feminine and neuter on the basis of inflectional and agreement properties and even features of the noun themselves. And it's not limited to what in the definition from the Longman Dictionary was called inherent gender. Okay, it's generally marked on nouns, but can be marked on verbs also, but we'll only talk about nouns today. So the word, the origin of the word through Old French um, and the modern form of that is genre, which is about types as well, goes back to the Latin word genus, a birth, a family, a nation. And the earliest meanings in English were kind or sort or a type or class of noun. And so we have this word genus, which we use in biology, the genus and species, that's a grouping word, like there's a certain type of living beings that belong to a particular group. Okay, the most usual modern meaning of gender, of course, relates to biological sex. What is your gender, you will be asked. My mother tells me that when she was young, when you had to fill out forms, it always said sex, masculine or feminine. Today, forms will say gender and often offer more than the two choices that used to be offered long ago. We're not talking about that kind of gender. We're talking here about the classification of nouns. So where is it marked in languages? Well, there are some languages where every noun marks gender in some form. Latin, Sanskrit, French, Swahili, spoken in Africa. We've talked about that language before. Maung, a language of Northern Australia. And Cornish, the language of my ancestors, which I won't talk about very much here, except to say that in Cornish, you have to know whether a noun is masculine or feminine, not because of anything that happens to the noun, but because the first letter of an adjective that follows it will change if it is a feminine noun. Gender is marked at the level of noun classifiers in Assamese, as in Jean and Joni, um, uh, Duijon, you will say. That's gender, and it's grammatically present. It's grammatically present um, <coughs> in English in the third person singular pronouns he and she. And that's why many people are wanting to replace those with they. And in some languages, my last point there isn't as complete as it could be, in some languages it's not marked at any level in the grammar. Gender, of course, in terms of biological sex is still present. There will still be words for men and women, brother and sister, mother and father, but it is not a grammatical form. So let's have a look at how it works. So in Sanskrit, some of you may have studied Sanskrit, um, there are nouns which have different vowel stems. So there are a stems, i stems, u stems, and various others. But in the a stem system, you have words like kama, um, upakara, anilaha, putraha. There used to be an ha on the end there, and sharaha, all of which were masculine, and the a ah ending with a h huh sound at the end showed that it was masculine, whereas a long a ah would show that it was feminine. Ganta, ganya, gata. Upama, jinta. And finally, um would show that a word was um, neuter, duhkam, and asyam. Now, we can see that words like the word for sun is clearly masculine in the sense of biological sex. 
Girl is clearly feminine for the same reason. But is there a particular reason? Is there a particular motivation for including words like wind, arrow, desire, and favor as masculine and beloved story, similarity, and care or worry as feminine while sorrow and mouth are neuter? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but in general, it is kind of regarded that most words in a gender system like this, where every word has to be masculine, feminine, or neuter, most of the words go into a category not because of any inherent feature of the word itself. In French, you often can't tell what a word is. So I think the word for sweater um, and the word for lamp, one is masculine, one is feminine, but you can't actually tell from the form. Um, typically, words that are derived from a verb ending in EUR, so l'aspirateur, the vacuum, and l'ordinateur, the computer, typically these would be masculine, but if they're derived from adjectives, rougeur, largeur, they would be feminine. But EUR is the same in both cases. The thing that you can tell the difference by is the article, which is the L word at the front here. So if it's, if it's of the form L, L, just an L apostrophe, then it's this shows that it's masculine. If it's La, as in La largeur, La rougeur, then it's feminine, La and L. If those two words for vacuum and computer commence with vowels, and that's why the, the masculine um, article is reduced to an L apostrophe. Okay, gender agreement in French isn't marked on the noun, but is marked on its modifiers. So the word livre for a book and table for tables belong to different genders. Livre is masculine, table is feminine. There's nothing inherent about the gender of those words. There's nothing inherently masculine about books or feminine about tables. And the grammar doesn't show any difference on the noun itself. They both end in the letter E. So there's nothing that can show the different gender in the way that the ending in the Sanskrit word does show it. But when you have the word my in front of it, if it's masculine, it's mon, that's M-O-N. If it's feminine, it's ma, that's M-A. And when you have the word green after it, you can see that the masculine form is spelt V-E-R-T and the feminine is form, form is spelt V-E-R-T-E. -E. The pronunciation of French is a bit difficult and I can't remember um, it, what's the difference between the pronunciation of the masculine word for green and the feminine word for green, so I won't say them. But you can see that the gender is not marked on the noun itself, but on the words that agree with it. Now, gender has been around in languages for a long time. So ancient Egyptian, which is one of the languages that goes back a long time and has a lot of history. Here, gender was overtly marked as um, Sir Alan Gardner, who wrote a great big book, I should have brought it in to show you, a great big book um, about ancient Egyptian back in the 1920s that was republished many times and I spent seven pounds as a teenager buying a copy which was a lot of money in those days and I still have it um, but it's now been scanned and you can get um, a PDF of it online for free and I could use that PDF then to make this uh, table. So most feminine words end in T, and T is like a little semicircle. So if you look at the word for sky or heaven, which is put, there are, it has three symbols, a, a box, a little semicircle, which is the Egyptian way of, of thinking about a loaf of bread, and then a long symbol underneath, which is conveying the idea of the sky. The box is the letter P, 
The little semicircle is the letter T, but that word pronounced something like put or pet, meant sky or heaven, and that's feminine. But all the other words on this page, the first one, ra, ra, sun or day. The second one, yah, I can't pronounce these. We don't really know how they were pronounced because Egyptian did not write vowels, yah. The moon, the word for earth, ta, and the word for plan, sakhr. These words are all masculine because there is no final T. So let's have a look on the next slide and see if we can work out which are the feminine words in this set. Well, the answer is that the word for a man is masculine and the word for a, a woman, set, or set perhaps, is feminine. The word for a scribe is masculine and so far that has some connection with biological roles because back in ancient Egypt, scribes were overwhelmingly men. But achet, the horizon, per, a house, these are both masculine. Niwet, a town or a city, is feminine. And shah, a lake or a pool, is masculine. And there is no kind of sense, there is no reason why those words would be assigned to one gender or another, save that they have to be somewhere. Now, genders can be of many different types. So in Swahili, where, and we looked at this, I think we had an example of this last week, Swahili, gender is marked as a prefix, and there are, in the different genders of Swahili, always singular and plural forms. So the ex for persons, but, but it's unrelated to biological sex. So the first gender is the gender for persons. It has the form m in a singular and wa in a plural. Mtu person, watu persons. I think we saw the word for child last week and that had m in the singular and wa in the plural. If, they're, if they are trees and natural forces, you still get m in the singular, but you get me in the plural. Things that belong in groups like eyes, g in the singular, or sometimes a zero, but in the, in the case of i, it's g, and ma in the plural. So, jicho, macho. For artifacts, ki in the singular, v in the plural. Kisu, visu, etc. And this is called a gender system. Another language we'll talk about briefly, Maung, spoken in the Golden Islands off the north coast of Arnhem Land in Northern Territory, Australia. It has 370 speakers as at 2016. That's quite a large number for an Australian Aboriginal language, one of the tribal languages of Australia. Um, it is, there are languages in India that have that number of speakers or even less. There's a lot of very small languages and language varieties on the border with Myanmar, on the border with Burma, in Nagaland, Manipur, um, Arunachal, etc. But um, <coughs> those are very small languages in India. 370 in Australia is still reasonable. Now, the Maung system of gender is like this. So if you put E in front of a word, it will imply that it is masculine. The word lijap means an entity of some kind, a small entity, something small. So ilijap means a male human. Ingolaj, his name. If you put ninya in front of it, ninya lijap, then it's a female human. Ninya ngolaj, her name. Wu relates to geographical things. So here we have a gender system that's got masculine and feminine, but also other categories. Geographical, Wu. Vegetation, Ma. So Ma Li Jap is a small stick. Wu Li Jap is a small creek. Um, ma Ngulaj is the name of a, of a type of tree because Ngulaj means name. Aul Li Jap 
is a small edible entity like a small lamb, a small yam. So these are the five genders. The first one is masculine, made with the form e. The second one, feminine, made with the form ning. The third one, geographical, with the form wu. The fourth one, vegetation, with the form ma. The fifth one, edible, with the form ah. Okay, I'm going to leave you now with a couple of links that you might like to look up. The first of these is, these are both related to the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures, or the WALS. And the WALS is really interesting in containing lots of information about languages and some very lovely maps. And if we look at chapter 30, which is called Number of Genders, here you get some idea about how genders work across the world. If you can, have a look at it before we talk tomorrow. That'll be um, Friday. Okay, thank you very much.